This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Get to know Proximity Malt. We malt superior, European-style, low-protein varieties grown close to home in Delaware and Colorado. Domestically grown, precisely malted to style. With our team of seasoned experts and two brand-new malt houses, try what's really new in malt. Check us out at www.proximitymalt.com. So enzymes uh, called beta-glucosidase enzymes will cleave this bond between the sugar and the terpenoid, releasing aromatic terpenes that contribute to the flavor profile of the beer. So certain yeast strains are capable of transforming non-aromatic terpenoid glycosides, so the terpene bound to the sugar group, into an aromatic terpenoid. That's by the cleavage of the sugar from the aromatic terpenoid. This week on the show, Eric Abbott joins us to talk about the biotransformation of hops, how it works, some tools you can use to maximize it, and more. All right here on the Master Brewers Podcast. Biotransformation has been a hot topic in the industry for a few years now. We've seen some outstanding research, for example, the study from Sierra Nevada that we covered on episode 109. Help us better understand what's going on in that black box of biotransformation. Biotransformation is is very trendy right now. I think of it kind of as the, the third wave in the evolution of hoppy beer styles. First, we started adding more and more hops, uh, and that reached its extreme uh, with extreme hoppy IPAs. We started experimenting with new and interesting hop varieties and hop breeders got on board producing different types of hops. Now, biotransformation is that third wave, a a new tool in our toolbox that can uh, contribute to um, to different hop flavors uh, uh, from the same types of hops. So we're well aware of the ways in which uh, microorganisms can modify the beer uh, during fermentation. The yeast will metabolize sugar, produce alcohol and CO2, as well as esters, phenolic compounds, sometimes sulfur compounds, produces and reabsorbs diacetyl, and the list goes on. Uh, It shouldn't be any surprise to us that uh, yeast is able to interact with hop compounds as well and modify them as well. That's what we're we're really looking at here is um, hop biotransformation. Let's talk about what's in a hop cone. Where does aroma come from in the first place? Yeah, so there's a few different uh, contributors uh, to the flavor profile coming from hops. Uh, hops contain uh, different components, including polyphenols, resins, and essential oils. Uh, the essential oils include uh, a lot of the volatile aromatic compounds. And the oil fraction is divided into uh, different categories as well, um, including sulfur compounds, which are uh, present in very small quantities and really not very well characterized. Um, there's the hydrocarbon com- fraction as well as the oxygenated fraction. And a major component of these fractions are terpenoids. Uh, terpenoids are the largest family of plant specialized metabolites. They're metabolites that are found in all different types of plants that contribute to different metabolic functions in the plant as well as flavors, aromas, and and things like that. What are the different ways that hop compounds can be biologically transformed? There's a few different mechanisms for biotransforming components of the hops. 
One mechanism is chemical modification, which includes, uh, for example, uh, conversion of geraniol into citronellol or the conversion of linalool into um, to terpineol. This is a chemical modification of one chemical to make it into a completely different chemical with a different flavor profile. Another mechanism is the cleavage of non-aromatic conjugates from an aromatic terpenoid. Terpenoids can be bound to a sugar group, uh, when, and that bond is called a glycosidic bond. When a terpenoid is bound to a sugar, it is not, isn't, it is not aromatic, it's not volatile. When, en- when an enzyme cleaves that bond, it releases the sugar and releases the terpenoid uh, in its volatile form. And at that point, the, the, the terpenoid contributes to the flavor profile. So enzymes uh, called beta-glucosidase enzymes will cleave this bond between the sugar and the terpenoid, releasing aromatic terpenes that contribute to the flavor profile of the beer. Okay, before we get too far, let's hear a little bit more about chemical modification. Could you give us some real-world examples where one flavor compound is really converted into something that has a a very different aroma or flavor? Yeah, so I'll talk about one example that was studied by King and Dickinson, uh, published in 2003. Um, They noted a conversion of linalool into alpha-terpineol. So linalool is... uh, it's a terpene that has a very floral, sometimes spicy, very lavender-like, and sometimes a citrus-like aroma. And through a cyclization reaction, it is converted into alpha-terpineol. Alpha-terpineol has a lilac odor, um, also slightly citrus, but with notes that are a little bit more woody and earthy, and sometimes piney. Um, in their study, they noted that as linalool decreased in concentration in the beer throughout fermentation, the concentration of alpha terpineol increased correspondingly. Another example that they noted was a conversion of geraniol into beta citronellol. Geraniol has a very floral, rose-like, and geranium aroma. It's commonly used in the perfume industry, whereas beta citronellol as a floral, rosy, and sweet, but more citrus with green undertones. And again, as they, they noted a, a decrease in geranial concentration throughout fermentation, there was a corresponding increase in citronella, suggesting that one was converted into the other. Well, let's hear more about that second type, uh, the en- enzymatic biotransformation. Right, so the uh, enzymatic biotransformation... Um, the mechanism that is catalyzed by a beta-glucosidase enzyme is uh, cleavage of the, the sugar from an aromatic terpene. Um, so certain yeast strains are capable of transforming non-aromatic terpenoic glycosides, so the terpene bound to the sugar group, into an aromatic terpenoid. And that's by the cleavage of the sugar from the aromatic terpenoid. Um, this is catalyzed by a beta-glucosidase enzyme. Uh, there are certain strains that are known to have uh, expression of this uh, of this enzyme. Not all not all heat brewing strains pr- produce this enzyme, but certain strains, including uh, the Lalamal New England uh, BRY ninety seven and Bel Saison, are, are known to have this activity. Other strains uh, do not. Um, this activity has been well characterized in the wine industry, uh, notably with Britannomyces. Um, Britannomyces will produce some of the fruity tropical aromas um, by, through biotransformation of uh, components in the wine. Um, and unfortunately, for uh, many beer styles, the, the flavors that come from Britannomyces are not really desired. So it's it's desirable to promote this sort of biotransformation activity by selecting a strain that is known to have uh, beta glucosidase activity. Okay, and that enzymatic biotransformation can also free up more opportunities for the chemical biotransformation. Talk about that. Hop biotransformation is extremely complex, and there's many different mechanisms 
that are at play here. And we're only beginning to just stra- scratch the surface in terms of the, the mechanisms of what's going on here. Something that's very difficult to study in the brewery. Most breweries don't have the equipment that's necessary uh, to, to study these sorts of things. Um, so we're st- starting to study that in our lab as well as w- through collaborations uh, with university laboratories. Um, so through this, uh, because there's many different mechanisms, one, um, one mechanism may lead into another. For example, um, linalool that is bound to a sugar group, a linalool glycoside, can be metabolized uh, by a beta-glucosidase enzyme produced by a, a certain yeast strain, releasing glucose and linalool. Linalool contributes a different uh, flavor profile to the, to the beer. Linalool could in turn be converted chemically into alpha terpineol, uh, which uh, again gives a, a different flavor uh, profile. So starting from a single linalool glycoside, we get not only linalool produced, but linalool is then con- potentially converted into, uh, into alpha terpineol. Um, and all of these reactions acting, acting together, all of these different mechanisms of hop biotransformation contribute to the diversity of the flavor profile coming from the hops. Coming up. When is the most efficient time to add hops to get the maximum effect of biotransformation and hop flavor profile while minimizing the amount of hops that needed to be added? I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Support for this podcast is brought to you by ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, triclamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The District St. Paul, Minneapolis, February meeting and scholarship drive is February 21st at Bueller in Plymouth, Minnesota. District St. Louis meets February 21st at Third Wheel Brewing. District Carolina's winter technical conference is February 23rd at Old Mecklenburg Brewery in Charlotte. The 2019 California Joint Technical Conference is February 28th and March 1st in Paso Robles. District Northern Rockies meets in, meets March 1st in Bozeman. District Philadelphia meets at Flying Fish Brewing in Somerdale, New Jersey, March 8th. District Eastern Canada meets in Montreal, March 21st. District St. Louis also meets on March 21st at Urban Chestnuts Grove location. Don't miss the Maintaining a Clean Brewery webinar March 28th. It's not too early to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. Check out the full calendar of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. We talked about dry hop creep back on episode 98. Talk about what's similar here and what's different. So hop creep is another mechanism by which uh, the, the hop flavor may modify the beer after dry hopping. Uh, the mechanism is a little bit different. Uh, hop creep is associated with uh, the breakdown of uh, sugars already present in the, in the wort and potentially the um, the metabolism of dextrins from the beer leading to overcarbonation potentially. Um, biotransformation is a different mechanism whereby there's enzymes produced by the yeast that would modify the component, the sugar components that are present in a glycosidic bond and released by a glucosidase enzyme. Um, so that rather than 
metabolizing the sugars that are present in the malt. Um, hot biotransformation involves the um, the release of sugars that are that were bound to terpenoid compounds and the metabolism of those sugars. The beta glucosidase activity would not affect it, would not have any effect on the levels of dextrins, for example. Uh, whereas hop creep, I think in some cases, was shown to actually reduce the levels of dextrins in the beer. So that would not be a risk uh, from strains that have beta glucosidase enzyme. It's not, it's not comparable to a diastatic strain, for example. Uh, in the case of Bell Saison, you would have both, both the beta glucosidase activity as well as the glucoamylase activity, uh, leading to uh, the characteristic high attenuation of a diastatic strain. Talk about how you've gone about studying the effects of beta glucosidase. So the way that we've been able to narrow in and focus on this specific mechanism is by the use of purified enzymes. So we we have uh, purified enzymes. Uh, um, we have purified beta glucosidase enzymes. Um, with Lalmon, this is the the Lalzyme beta enzyme. Um, and by doing a, a trial with a, a brewery where they do a split batch of a brewed IPA, um, one was treated with a beta, the Lalzyme beta, beta glucosidase enzyme, and the other was untreated as a control group. The enzyme treated beer had uh, about twice as, uh, twice as much uh, terpene content in, in the enzyme treated beer um, compared to the, the control. Uh, broken down into specific terpenoids, there's 40% more mercine, 300% more linalol, 140% more humulene, and 80% more citronella. Uh, notably, there's a few uh, areas in which uh, we saw decreases as well. Uh, there was 20% less geraniol. In terms of the, um, the flavor profile, um, using both expert and consumer tasting panels, uh, tasters overwhelmed overwhelmingly preferred the enzyme-treated beer, noting it as being cleaner, brighter, and having a hoppier flavor. Do you want to talk about some of the trade-offs in regards to the timing of dry hopping? Yeah, so in addition to the chemical mo modification or uh, beta-glucosidase activity mechanisms of biotransformation, there's a few mechanisms by which uh, the yeast uh, may have a negative effect on the hoppiness of the final, bit, final beer. That includes CO2 stripping, whereby the CO2 produced during fermentation will strip the volatile components out of the beer. Uh, if your fermentation room smells delicious during fermentation, that means you're losing all of those volatiles from the beer. Um, so that's one potential mechanism. Um, other flavor components uh, produced by the, the yeast may mask the, the flavors by the, produced uh, by the hops. Um, there's also uh, absorption to the the yeast cell membrane, or whereby hop oils will actually stick to the outside of the yeast cells and settle down to the bottom of the fermenter uh, during flocculation. Um, and in that case as well, the, the hop oils are removed from the beer. Um, in order to maximize the effects from biotransformation, we recommend hopping during active fermentation, but towards the end of fermentation. This reduces effects from CO2 stripping, adsorption to the yeast cell membrane, and also reduces the potential effects of um, oxygen uptake uh, because there is still some fermentation occurring and CO2 being produced at the end of fermentation. Yet uh, there is still active yeast present, actively fermenting, actively metabolizing. So there is still opportunity for interaction with the, the hop oils uh, by doing a late fermentation addition. For example, uh, oh, there's no hard and fast rules about this, but uh, perhaps uh, in the last 24 to 48 hours of fermentation before final attenuation is achieved. If CO2 stripping can drive off so much aroma, then why all the hype around dry hopping very early in fermentation for New England IPAs? I, I think that you will get uh, a high degree of biotransformation by uh, very early hopping. It's a question of efficiency. Uh, you may get uh, 
just as much or even greater hop uh, biotransformation by making additions during the middle or the end of uh, fermentation. Um, the important thing is that additions are made when yeast is still actively metabolizing. Um, in terms of efficiency, if, if you don't mind adding lots and lots of hops, uh, by all means, add hops uh, early, middle, and late fermentation. Uh, it would be interesting to see a follow-up study at some point uh, to, to narrow in on this question of efficiency. When is the most efficient um, when is the most efficient time to add hops to get the maximum effect of biotransformation and hop flavor profile while minimizing the amount of hops that needed to be added and thereby saving money for the brewer? Um, we're very interested in that sort of question. And we'd like to follow up with that. You're probably not the only ones. Okay, uh, you did an experiment for a recent Master Brewers meeting. Talk about that. Yeah, so we did a, a cask experiment where we collaborated with uh, Mike Harrison uh, at the Brasser de Montréal. Um, we took uh, the same wort and split it into three fermenters uh, using two different types of yeast, the New England strain, which is beta-glucosidase positive, as well as the Nottingham strain, which is glucosidase negative as a control strain. We dry hopped using the same hops, but using a different timing. Uh, the hops used were Mosaic, Citra, and Cascade. So the first cask was fermented with New England, uh, glucosidase positive, and dry hopped after fermentation so at day eight. So there was no, we didn't expect any biotransformation because the yeast was already starting to settle. Um, this cask was intended to show the flavor profile from from the yeast fermentation alone and not from biotransformation. The second cask was fermented with Nottingham, a glucosidase negative strain, and dry hopped during fermentation. Um, so uh, yeast was present during active fermentation, but it's with the yeast strain that was negative for the, the enzyme. Um, so this, this cask was intended to show the effects of early dry hopping, but without biotransformation as well. The third cask was our biotransformation uh, cask. It had New England, but dry hopped uh, on day two of fermentation during active fermentation. And you, you served these beers at the, at the Master Brewers meeting, right? Yes, these, these beers were served at the Master Brewer meeting after the, after the presentations uh, during the hop workshop. So we had everybody coming by to taste. Uh, we had some, some comments on the beer. Uh, generally, it was found that the the biotransformation cask with New England hopped early in fermentation um, or at day two. Uh, it had a little bit smoother profile, a little bit more tropical notes coming from uh, coming from the, the coming from the hops, um, suggesting there was a biotransformation effect. It was clearly different from the the beer that was fermented with New England, but dry hopped late in fermentation. Um, it's interesting that uh, when we looked at the, the fermentation profile, the cask that was dry hopped after fermentation had a slightly higher gravity, suggesting that uh, there was um, components that were in the yeast um, that were able to be metabolized by the yeast when the hops were added during fermentation. Um, another interesting thing that we noted during the tasting is that some people did still prefer the uh, did still prefer the 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 beer that was dry hopped um, after fermentation as well. So it's a biotransformation. It's it's not the it's not a silver bullet to give you better beer in all cases. It really depends on what you're trying to produce. It tends to produce uh, tropical fruity aromas. If what you're going for is uh, piney and earthy, maybe um, maybe go with a strain that does not have that uh, biotransformation activity. Um, it just highlights the importance of strain selection in uh, optimizing biotransformation and producing the, the type of flavor profile you want to see in your final product. And you made an interesting observation in regards to age. Talk about that. Yeah, so another thing that we saw was that uh, some of the older brewers tended to prefer the, the classic um, hop flavor from, um, from a more traditional dry hopping method after fermentation and with a, a more neutral strain. Um, you know, the typical citrus and piney uh, flavor that you get from the sea hops. 
Um, so different, uh, different people will prefer different types of beer. And uh, um, beta-glucosidase enzyme produced by certain strains as another tool in your toolbox for developing different types of flavors for expanding your the flavor profiles from your the products you're offering. That was Eric Abbott here on the Master Brewers podcast. If you like what you heard today, check out the District Eastern Canada presentation archive, where you can download Eric's biotransformation presentation. That's under the meetings tab at mbaa.com. Did you know that Master Brewers now has a mobile app? TQ articles, podcasts, webinars, Ask the Brewmasters, and more, all in the same place. Search Master Brewers in the App Store to download it now. And then I fall on the ground Just like that one day, like everyone else did Calm down, I'm moving too fast And then I hit on the ground Just like that one day